welcome David Sirota to Useful Idiots. Welcome thanks back. For, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Actually, there's a question I want to ask you before we even get to the political stuff. There's been a lot of talk about Substack. You're on Substack, oh, and yeah. you're one of the you're one of the few people that's already gone to the next step of sort of hiring other reporters and doing yeah. making yeah. it more like a news service. Can you talk about your thought process with that and what you would say to the people who've been criticizing? Sure. I mean, I, you know, whether it's Substack or Ghost or anywhere else, I mean, there's there's clearly a move uh, to more independent media. Uh, the public has lost faith in the media. I mean, frankly. I'm shocked it took so long for the for polls to show that that lots and lots of people have lost faith in the media. I mean, this is the corporate media, and I, I don't like speaking to, in total generalities as like a monolith. There is no nothing that's like you know the media, but when we're talking about right. sort of corporate elite legacy media outlets, I mean, these are the outlets that that promoted the lies that led us into the Iraq war. They're the uh, outlets that promoted the lies that justified the financial deregulation that ended up creating a financial crisis that blew up the economy. I mean, I could go on and on. Mm. So it has taken a long time for, I think, the public to correctly realize that what is being delivered by many corporate media outlets. It's not that it's all wrong or that it's all fake news, but that there's a lot of ideology baked into there. There's a lot of unstated uh, biases that are baked into the coverage there. Uh, and now I'm not just talking about on the opinion pages, I'm talking right. about in the news itself. And that now, you know, there is a move, people are looking for independent voices. And I think that the, whatever platform it is, Substack or Ghost or anywhere else, that people are looking for those independent voices. And the, the panic, in the media industry over this, first of all, it's like completely disproportionate, right? I mean, let's be very clear, like the move to independent media, it's, you know, it's a far cry from this in that entire space, even uh, uh, occupying a space as big as one of the major legacy outlets like that, like, so, so the, the panic is disproportionate to what's actually happening in the industry. But the fact that it is disproportionate shows I think that folks inside of the corporate legacy media understand their vulnerabilities and they understand that the vulnerability is, is that, you know, people have lost a lot of faith in, in, in those institutions. And, you know, what they want to do is they want to sort of blame independent media producers uh, for this, you know, oh, you know, the move to Substack and Ghost and all these other places uh, that, you know, this is the, the threat to journalism. It's like, no, actually, you've created a vulnerability by not doing your job very well. And, and not to get too far afield here. But it's because it's a, it's a project that I've been working on lately, which is that there's kind of a, um, a through line here, hear me out, to, to what happened after the 2016 election. So, so the Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders fight, where people then blamed Bernie Sanders for Hillary Clinton losing to Donald Trump, what that really was, was, you know, Hillary Clinton was, ran such a bad campaign and was so inherently vulnerable despite having all of the institutional support behind her that this senator from a tiny state with you know not a ton of conventional charisma was able to almost uh, win and was able to run a really credible campaign now no disrespect to bernie he ran a good campaign, great campaign, but like that was first and foremost a referendum on the institutional problems of the Democratic Party and Hillary Clinton. It's the same sort, and and, and so then they blamed Bernie. Oh, Bernie, you know the reason why Hillary lost was because of Bernie Sanders. A lot of garbage, right? But it's there's the same dynamic in media now. It's like the New York Times, the Washington, all these you know cable TV news. Oh my God, like the Substack and independent media producers. It's like you know they're ruining journalism. It's their fault that journalism is going down. It's the same dynamic. It's like actually no. The the issue is is that you have every shred of power on your side. Right. And the fact that anybody's able to now compete in even a small way with you is actually first and foremost a referendum on you, <laughs> like on your failings. It's not a necessarily a referendum on how amazing the independent producers are. It's a referendum on how weakened, rightly so, the institutional media actually is for real reasons. Yeah, I mean, it's true. It, it, it's kind of under reported how amazing that 2016 story was that he that he got what was it 37 percent of, of the delegates yeah. ultimately yeah. right yeah and it wasn't like he was you know raking in free media like trump either i mean you know there, and, and there wasn't an avalanche of financial support that was coming for it was it was almost entirely like from a non-institutional uh you know framework that all that all those votes were coming in and it, it's the same dynamic that the institutional power 
will blame right. externally smaller competitors who shouldn't even be able to compete. They will blame them as opposed to saying, you know what, maybe the fact that these smaller competitors are, are with the deck stacked against them are able to actually compete is actually a really sad, really alarming referendum <laughs> on how much we have actually right. failed in a and huge, what losers like it should are. be a moment for self-reflection. Yeah, right. Of course not. Right. Yeah. It's funny because uh, there's I mean, I'm reminded of that famous image of famous moment where the cameras went from Bernie Sanders giving a speech to an empty podium that Trump was about to speak at. It's like yeah. perfect yeah. metaphor for the yeah. way that the media treated them. I was it's interesting because also I was going to ask you when you were talking about media bias, if working on the Bernie campaign heightened your awareness of it or if it was just a confirmation of what you had already seen, given how crazily over the top it was. No, I mean, look, institutional power is going to come up with every reason to to say that it's done nothing wrong and every and every reason to say that anybody who questions it is 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 evil or wrong or, you know, marginalized or, or, or whatever. I mean, it, that, that is a through line in America. It's it's really sad. I mean, we still have not had a reckoning with the lies that led us into the Iraq war. We still have not had a reckoning with the fact that the last democratic administration refused to prosecute anybody in, in any real way uh, connected to the financial crisis. I mean, that is just, we now have a 15 minute memory uh, in, in our society. I call it goldfish culture. Uh, our culture forgets its entire world every 15 minutes. So there is no uh, accountability. And so the latest storyline uh, when it comes to independent media, Substack, Ghost, all these other ones, the, the latest storyline is let's not think about all of the other institutions institutional failures that have happened in corporate media over many decades. Let's say, let's just say that the story of the moment in the in these 15 minutes that we can even remember is that somehow from somewhere, people posting things on the internet and being able to email them out uh, is now an right. existential threat to journalism because of nothing that we, the institutional corporate media, did. It's it's all just it's all these bad, evil, nefarious actors. It's a whole lot of crap. I mean, look, our country decades ago, went through a period where there was a much smaller, more vibrant press in the sense of smaller individual outlets, many small individual outlets. Uh, there was a lot of concern with bigger outlets in the mid 20th century. I mean, Citizen Kane, right? Like the movie Citizen Kane is among other things, kind of a cautionary tale about what happens when media gets too big at the behest too of Warren, yeah. uh, too concentrated, right? I mean, there's that famous line from the movie where he says, she goes, um, uh, she's talking to Charles Kane. She goes, what What are they gonna think? They'll, and he says like, they'll think what I tell them to think. I'm, I'm butchering the line, but it's basically like, it's the danger of the media monopoly. And so my view is if the future of media is lots of small outlets, lot many, many smaller outlets, Yes, one problem will be that there isn't one necessary collective source of information that we're all stipulating is true. That is a real problem in, in our country right now. And, and if there is a smaller, more vibrant, vibrant press, I don't think that solves that problem that we can't stipulate. Okay, fact A, B, and C are true. Now we can all debate what they mean. Th th that is going away and that's a problem. But I think a benefit of a media that's less concentrated, less consolidated is that when there was a media that was deciding fact A, B, and C, you know, three channels, you know, for a couple of newspapers, uh, there was a whole set of information and facts that were just not even in the conversation. And I'd rather have to address the problem of getting people and the country to stipulate basic facts with a vibrant, deconcentrated media than have a situation where three or four people or three or four corporations get to, ch get to decide uh, what anybody thinks and talks about. Mm. Not to linger on that, but we've already sort of established that the subscriber model can support podcasts. It made Joe Rogan wealthy, Bill Simmons, and you know lots of other people. It clearly does well for op-ed writing. Can it support reporting, though? Like, I mean, it seems like you're trying to make a test case of that a little bit. Yeah. The, I mean, that's a, t that's a, that's a tough. It's, it's a tough question. I mean, we we and we're doing well, uh, and and I'm I'm happy about it. But I think that's the big question. Will subscribers support the kind of day-to-day, -day, uh, grinded out reporting that isn't being done, that needs to be done, that's, that's necessary to a healthy democracy, but that 
doesn't necessarily all the time fit into a kind of clickbaity, uh, explosive story of the day kind of model. I mean, I always say in, in our work, like, I'd like to step up to the plate and, and hit a home run every day. But when you're doing, you know, reporting every single day, you know, you're really just trying to like hit base hits, right? And once in a while, you'll hit a double or a triple or a home run or whatever, but like, you're trying to hit base hits. And the question is, will a subscriber model support day-to-day -day base hits and and i don't know i mean i it, i mean so far yes at, at at our level sure but like is that can you actually build a model like that that's the question yeah that, that's what I, I haven't figured that e that out either right like even if you're trying to go back and forth and do feature writing basically is it used to be in magazines an effort to try to anticip anticipate a home run eight weeks down the road yep but this model you, you can't wait that long you gotta you no. gotta figure out something that's gonna drive engagement in the yep. next couple of weeks and reporting takes that long people should definitely subscribe to you because you're i think you're kind of on the cutting edge of trying, we're trying. trying to do i mean yeah. we're, we're, we're we're trying i mean it's like long i mean i'm not complaining but it's like you know long hours like you know six days a week you know you know you're just you're because you know that the metabolism of the information ecosystem is unfortunately faster than than the process of of reporting forget good about writing every just single reporting. Day. Oh, forget yeah. about writing right just like talking to people and reporting right totally can you talk about some of the stories you and your colleagues have broken at daily poster sure so the, the big i mean the big ones that we broke over the last year i mean we broke open the story uh of andrew cuomo and the nursing home situation in this sense this piece of the story which was that he took lots of money he and his political machine from a major donor uh, that then had him uh, and took credit for it, had him insert language into the state budget, uh, granting uh, legal immunity to the corporate owners of nursing homes uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so basically removing a deterrent to bad corporate behavior during the pandemic, uh, shielding them from lawsuits if and when they their business decisions kill people. So we, we broke that open. Uh, we've broken open, uh, you know, a lot of stories, very like recently, we broke open uh, uh, some stories about the minimum wage. I mean, that's a real sort of sick debate. I mean, we, we broke open the story about restaurant CEOs actually telling their investors that if the minimum wage goes up, it won't actually hurt their, uh, their bottom line. Uh, uh, we broke open the story of, um, you know, uh, Kristen Cinema and uh, Joe Manchin uh, actually attending closed door meetings with one of the big lobby groups uh, that is fighting uh, a hike in the minimum wage. So we try to look. We try. I could I could go on and on and bore yeah. you with that, but well, we want to get into to, some of those. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and so you know we're trying to break open the stories that corporate legacy media is just not all that interested in. One of the ones that you're on right now is the the uh, state and local tax salt. Yeah. yeah. Exem exemption. Can you talk a I'm little real bit? I'm real mad about it. Yeah. yeah. Are you? Yeah. 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 I'm well, real mad about it. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's such a classic unreported story because it just falls through every crack uh, yes. that could possibly exist because there's, there's no institutional constituency that wants anybody to hear about it. Right. Correct. So, Even though, you know, and, and listen, it only, it, it only is a $600 billion situation, mm -hmm. $600 billion. Like it's incredible. It, it's so I'll explain for folks yeah. who don't know what's going on here. So in Donald Trump's tax bill, his horrible regressive tax bill, uh, he had a mean spirited, at least motivated by a mean spirited desire. So I'm going to let's stipulate that to uh, it's funny, though, it is, it is kind of like funny <laughs> that, that this is where it came from, is that it wasn't like he wanted a good tax policy. It wasn't like, he, you know, he was right, just like, I don't like blue states so who, voted, who vote against it. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I don't like blue states who vote against me. So like, how can we try to like hurt them? You know, so he proposed uh, limiting the amount uh, uh, that you can deduct off of your federal tax uh, return, the amount that you pay in state and local taxes, limiting that to $10,000. Before it was, if, if you paid property taxes, state and local taxes, and, and this is an important point, and if you itemized your taxes, right? You didn't take the standard deduction. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. If you, it used to be that you could write off all of your property taxes. So if you own a mansion and you're paying a lot in property taxes because your mansion is right, you know, is expensive and is right on the water, you know, on a beach, uh, you're, you, you could write off all of the property taxes that you paid. So Trump was like, I, you know, yeah. state and local taxes are, are, are higher, comparatively higher in blue states than they are in red states. So I'm going to cap the amount at $10,000 that people can write off on their federal tax returns. Uh, so mean spirited motivation, actually the one piece of his tax bill so that funny. was actually really progressive for two reasons. One, 
the largest share of state and local taxes are paid uh, as you go up the income ladder by wealthy people. I just mentioned the mansion owner. Uh, and two, this is really important, people forget this, is that most people, it's now 90% of tax filers take the standard deduction. And what that means is that the standard deduction is bigger is, than the, yeah. <laughs> is bigger, is a better deal for them than itemizing their returns. So, and, and the reason it's a better deal is because, is because they're not making enough, more, enough money to make it a better deal to itemize. So in other words- Which, which is, is by the way, just incredible by itself. But anyway, go ahead. It, it is incredible. So this whole issue only is talking about the 10% of the population that doesn't take the newly expanded standard deduction. Okay, so, so keep that in your mind. We're talking about 10% of the population that tend to be not all, but tend to be the wealthiest people in the country. So the Democrats, they came into office, blue state Democrats in particular, New Jersey, New York, uh, 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 Connecticut, they came in and they're like, so let's rewind a few weeks. They said, we're not gonna draw a line in the sand and withhold our house votes on something like the $15 minimum wage. Some of them said, we want to reduce the amount of the survival checks or the eligibility for those stimulus survival checks because we don't want them going to, to families that don't, quote, need these one-time stimulus checks. They did all that, the, stimu the stimulus bill passed. Now they're saying, we will withhold our votes. We will vote down the next spending bill unless it includes a full repeal, not a raise, a full repeal of the cap on SALT deductions to say you can deduct not just 10,000, you can deduct all of it. This proposal, okay, so we're not putting a line in the sand for the minimum wage. We're not putting a line, we're gonna try to reduce survival oh, checks. Oh and wait, then they, weeks, they, they wanna go further than it was previously. Well, no, they wanna, they wanna just bring oh, it I back see. Okay, to, right. to, yeah. Gotcha, okay. To pre-Trump? Right, right. So we're not gonna put a line in the sand for the minimum wage. Not, we're gonna try to reduce one-time survival checks. And then literally weeks later, they are saying, we are gonna draw a line in the sand. We will take down Joe Biden's infrastructure bill unless it includes a full repeal of the salt caps, which now here's the punchline, which would deliver 80% of the benefits to the top 5% of the country. Let me give you a stat, because there are going to be people who are listening from New York City who have heard, oh, you know, the salt, the salt caps are killing me. The salt caps are... Let me give you a stat about New York City. The median household income in New York City is $63,000. Now, I know a lot of people are going to oh, I can't believe that. I make $200,000. It's hard to live in New York. I'm not saying it's hard or easy. I'm just giving you the stats here. Median household income in New York City, $63,000. Uh, 2%, 2% of people making that amount of money would qualify for any benefit at all from a salt cap repeal. So basically the average person making, or 98% of people making $63,000, the middle class median in New York City would get zero, zero dollars from a salt cap repeal. Meanwhile, the average person in New York City's top 1% or New York State's top 1% uh, is, is a person who makes on average $3.2 million a year. That household, gets $100,000 of new tax breaks every single year permanently from a SALT cap repeal. Now, why is that disparity like that? Well, again, it's because of property taxes and who owns things. But also, again, most people are taking the standard deduction. So if you're making, th th this is why this policy, so the really horrible, the reason that I said at the beginning, I'm real mad about this. The horrible part of this is, is that these Democratic lawmakers are going out and saying the salt cap repeal is to help the middle class. This is akin, I swear to God, this is akin to the Republicans saying the estate tax, to cut the estate tax on billionaires. It's almost worse, tax, actually. Is for family farmers. I, I actually think you're, you're right. It could be worse. It yeah. literally could be because it's such a wild. So the bottom line stat that I've said to people that kind of blows their mind. You know, rank and file Democrats who've emailed me. Or I said, you were opposed to the Trump tax. Said, oh, the Trump taxes are terrible. They were a giveaway to the rich. This policy repealing the salt cap, this is not an interpretation. This is arithmetic. Repealing the salt cap is far more regressive, gives funnels more of the percentage of money to the super rich than all of the Donald Trump tax cuts. I'm not talking about the net amount of money. I'm talking yeah. about who benefits 
from when you cut that pie. This is actually a more regressive policy. The Democrats are pushing a more regressive policy than the Trump tax cuts that these same Democrats spent you know, two years vilifying. Rightly so, they were rightly vilifying. Do, do you think that they're taking advantage of that kind of Trump uh, derangement syndrome, which I know is a right-wing term, so I, we have to come up with a less right-wing term, but where anything Trump does is bad, regardless of, of, of what it is. So it's just like the reactionary liberal, I mean, the Dems have, Democrats have a reactionary anti-Trump position where they don't actually look at the at the content. Well, I think there's two things going on. One, I think that's absolutely right. Some people say this is a Donald Trump policy. He was trying to punish the blue states, you know, and we got to get rid of it. Now, look, I, I stipulate that like Donald Trump's motives were he yeah, was being course, right. like an a-hole, right? Like he he just it wasn't motivated. Like he his his sort of weirdly his like you know, sort of being an a-hole right. led him into a policy that actually was right. the one thing that was progressive. It's there, a glitch. You know? It was it was a glitch. Exactly. So I stipulate that. But but and but just because the motive is wrong doesn't mean the policy should be you know repealed. Now, but I think there's something deeper going on. I mean, I really do. The last twenty-five to thirty years, people making not ju not just billionaires. We have to have a conversation about this. It's not just billionaires. People making two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars have been showered with tax break after tax break after tax break. Right? The people complaining about I can only write off ten thousand dollars of my state and local taxes, and I make let's say two hundred thousand dollars a year, and I live in New York, and the property taxes are high. It's like you're already benefiting from a mortgage interest tax deduction on the first seven hundred fifty thousand dollars of your mortgage. Okay, that is a tax break that people who don't own homes that that is a tax break that is mostly uh, benefits the wealthy because they're mostly homeowners. So you're already benefiting from. It's the also a subsidy tax. of of the banking industry, the real totally. estate industry, right? Yeah. Totally. So you're mm -hmm. already benefiting from that. You're benefiting from a preferential capital gains tax rate on your savings and your 401k and your investments. You're benefiting from Donald Trump's marginal rate income tax cuts and George Bush's marginal rate income tax cuts. So like. What's really sick about this is like, it's like you, you've you been getting all of these gifts, like all of these gifts, right? Like all of them for years. And then somebody's like, I'm not just gonna take away your salt deduction. I'm just gonna give this one gift that we give you, we're gonna make it like a little smaller. It's gonna be like a smaller gift. And you're like, I'm oppressed. Like, how dare you? I am like, a, and it's like, it's like, look, I'm not saying somebody making, you know, 250 in, living in New York City, I'm not saying they're living like a billionaire, right? I'm not, I'm not you know, I, but they're not, but on the merits, they're not middle class. That is not the middle of New York City. And like, people don't like to admit that. And, and so by saying a repeal of salt is regressive, I think people feel like attacked, like you're saying that they're, you know, they're a billionaire, but like people don't like admitting that they're affluent. Like, and that they've been given and are still getting so much. Like, everybody likes to feel oppressed, but like, like it, it's just, it's, it, there is like a greed and there, and, and not just greed, there's like a, a lack of self awareness. Yeah, it's like a bubble. When, yeah. When you zoom out, you say to people, you know, did you know that the average you know, median household income is about 60, 60 grand in New York City? It's like, I, I don't think people have any awareness of that. Right. <laughs> but I, and from the politician's perspective, by the way, I, I'm sorry, I buried the lead on this. We know that a disproportionate amount of their campaign funding comes obviously from people who are in the affluent class, not just from billionaires, but people who are in the affluent class. I mean, there was a there was a stat that was something like it's some disproportionate amount of money that people get that politicians get in five thousand dollar increments, not surprisingly, comes from people who literally are earning more than a million dollars. Those are the same exact people who would benefit from a repeal of the salt cap. So it's it's a, it's a ridiculous number. I forget, right? The yeah, the... It's, it, it's like incredible. I mean, mm -hmm. it, you know. And look, there are ways to 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 to. Yes, can you give me an anecdote of somebody at the bottom edge of the you know top, I don't know, ten percent who's getting hit with with because they the the salt issue, sure. But like, here's the other tell that the Democrats are really trying to enrich the super rich. Any raise of that cap is regressive. Let's just stipulate that. Any if you raise it to 15, 20, 30, whatever, it's regressive. But it, you could stand, you know, you, you could have a conversation like, look, I think 10 is too low, like just to deal with people at the bottom. They're pushing for a full repeal. 
right? Th like that's the tell that this is about helping the like the really rich, like the crazy rich, is that you're not saying let's move 10 to 15 or let's move 10 to 20. You're talking about a full repeal, right? You're talking about a full repeal and you're threatening to take down your own president's uh, spending bill because of it. Like this, this is a like class war stuff. What about the parliamentarian? They're not worried about the parliamentarian. <laughs> no, the parliamentarian doesn't care when you're cutting taxes for, for rich people. Yeah, and, and, and as you pointed out, we've started to see this stuff creep into the coverage about how $300,000 income is middle class. And oh, yeah. you know, people are living yeah. paycheck to paycheck with 250 oh, or something like that. Like that was kind of a tell for me when I, when I, when I started to see that theme, it's just every now and then it appears on Twitter. It's like, it's like a, uh, it's like a little late motif. That, yes. That, I mean, that, but that's been, there's been a drumbeat for that in the, in the, speaking of media, in the corporate, you know, elite legacy media. Yeah. I, and we've included it in our story about this, you know, where there are headlines where, you know, the, 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 the one that was famous, I mean, now I'm showing how old I am. Uh, I think it was in 2008 was when the uh, Washington Post published uh, uh, the headline was squeaking by on $300,000. <laughs> You're like, what world are you living in? Like, like I'm not, look again, I'm not saying if you're living, you know, 300 grand in, you know, San Francisco or New York, like, I'm not saying you got like a private jet and you're like, you know, living the super high life, but like, you're not squeaking by, you know, right. like you're not. Who in the caucus is, is the, is the biggest driver of this uh, situation? Well, you got, I mean, this relates to a problem that you have with the, who the leaders are. Okay. Nancy Pelosi. Chuck Schumer uh, and most of the New York delegation and the New Jersey delegation uh, and a lot of members from Connecticut. But but you you have I mean, the two leaders of the party, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, are from states where this has been ginned up as an issue. And nobody in, the, in those states uh, or very few politicians in those states are willing to say, hey, uh, this is a giveaway to the rich. Now, we should pause here and give a significant, and I really mean it, a significant amount of credit to AOC, who the New York delegation put out a letter where it was every New York lawmaker in the House except for two. And AOC was one of them who refused to sign it. And it was the letter saying, we're going to take down this bill unless you include this, the, these uh, repeal of these caps. And AOC said publicly, uh, this is a giveaway to billionaires. Now, the reason I say that it's important to recognize that is because that is not easy local politics for somebody like her, right? I mean, she is in New York City. She has faced a primary that like, I don't care what any, you know, okay, well, you know, well, is she going to back this up with votes or whatever? We'll have to see on that. And that's worth watching. But the fact that she's even speaking up when the entire political establishment in that state is, is basically forwarding and putting out there into the, into the, popular you know mind that this is a middle class initiative the fact that she's willing to stand up and say that i think is a really big deal because because you can understand like you know if you try to stand up and say that this mythology is being put out there and people and you're being cast as somebody who doesn't care about the middle class right. like it, it's like that psychology takes hold and and by the way on issues of taxes as you noted when you talk to people this becomes like a matter of religion where like people, you, you can't even have like a rational conversation. You're throwing numbers at them and they don't want to hear it, right? They just, they just, I'm oppressed. I don't want to pay these taxes. Like I can't even process the numbers you're throwing at me because this is not a policy debate. This is like a matter of theology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Josh Gottheimer is another great guy. Another great one. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's like, to, right. I mean, he's like the archetypal. New Jersey rep. And, yeah. I mean, in the worst one, honestly. Like this guy Swazi in yeah. uh, on Long Island. I mean, yeah. this is a guy who literally was like, "I want to reduce survival yeah. checks for the middle class." Like he, that was his thing. Like he was making a thing out of it. Like I want to reduce. The, I, we have to make sure these survival checks go to people who really need the money. Yeah. And then I'm going to turn right around and like literally create a bipartisan salt caucus in the House uh, to push for salt tax cuts, 80% of which go to the top 5% of the country. I mean, it's, it's like these people, they, I mean, it's so shameless. And yeah. by the way, last thing to say on, uh, on that part, which is they can be shameless because they don't have to fear a media being like, uh, you're basically bullshitting. Like they, 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 they like the, the lack of an aggressive, uh, accountability media creates a psychology among a rank and file house member. It's like, I don't even have to care about being called out on this because like, I'm not going to get called not out at all. Yeah. Like, 
One of the most like pernicious, I think, arguments is the we should just give this to the people who really need it, because that, I think, lands on people who have good politics. Like mm -hmm. they think that it's actually a fair, just thing. They don't get why it's problematic. They don't get why uh, needs testing is problematic and why it actually harms the, like the most marginalized. Can you can you go over that? Yeah, I mean, I think like during the stimulus bill, the effort to, to decide who needs something and who doesn't uh, and aiming that argument, let's be clear, aiming that argument at people making like, remember the, the debate was like 80 grand or something like that. Like we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're in the middle of like a, like you're aiming that argument at people making 80 grand and you're not aiming that argument at like billionaires and multimillionaires. Like it's not just the means testing right. and the, the sort of needs argument. It's like, who is that aimed at, right? right? Like, like it, it's so selectively aimed at people who really do need help yeah. in, in this country. I mean, we are a society that just has given away so much to people who not only don't need it, but like have to work to spend it, right? Like uh, there was a stat recently, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go give the exact number because I can't remember what it was, but it was like something like Bill Gates's foundation, even what was spending like billions of dollars in philanthropy was still like, it couldn't spend itself down because it was making so much money on the stock market like they have to work to reduce the principle that they're that they're making because they're making so much so then have so, so to have that in your society and then be like i don't think somebody making 80 grand needs right. an extra 200 bucks you're like like something has gone really really wrong in your society I heard something like that. It was uh, it was a similar thing. It had to do with uh, I think it was either Amazon or Facebook. It was talking about how the rate they're making money. If you, if you had a machine that printed dollars every uh, every second, that it would it would it would be impossible to make a mechanical machine that would be fast enough to, to catch up. To yes. The rest of the rate. <laughs> yes. Know? Yes. And then you start talking about like like you know if it's not co companies at least in theory are, are like making a thing or delivering a service right. i think with the philanthropy stuff and and like mm -hmm. the college endowment stuff it's just like money that's just like sitting there it's just like mm -hmm. sitting in the stock market it's like not it's not actually like doing anything it's just like it's it's like the 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 definition of like idle money the the call the bluff on the salt tax cap repeal people the 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 bluff calling would be okay you want your salt tax okay great you get go ahead We're, no salt. You can deduct all of your state and local taxes in exchange for one simple thing. Simple thing. There's no preferential tax rate anymore for capital gains. Okay. There's no difference between capital gains and income anymore. Like that's it. Deal. That seems fair, right? Like if you earn money on the stock market, that should be counted as income. Just like if you earn money and you go out and you, you, you're, you're doing your job. Like <laughs> yeah, that, that'll that, happen. That, never. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right. And, and the fact that that will never happen is the tell, right? Like, cause why should money that you make in the stock market just by day trading or just putting it in your 401k, why should that money be taxed at a lower rate than money that you're earning at, at your job? Like there's there's no, I mean, I know what the, the sort of rhetorical argument is, but there's no actual reason for that. So to me, that's that would be my trade. Be like, okay, everyone gets to deduct your, your mansion property taxes. Great, good for you. But capital gains rate, is there's no more capital gains rate anymore. It's just everything's income. Okay, deal? You got a good deal there. <laughs> right. We don't have a good deal there. Yeah, no, and that. Why does that issue never come up? The carried interest rate. I mean, it came up a little bit during the Biden the mentioned it very recently. Like yeah. I think it was like today that there might be some effort to adjust it. it. John Edwards, of all people, in 08, his whole thing was like, "We're just going to have one. We're going to tax simplification. We're going to. I mean, you know." And then he became John Edwards, the you know the John Edwards that we all remember. The haircut, now. right? Yeah. Haircut. yeah. yeah. I mean, the reason why that issue doesn't come up is because every corporation and every rich person in America it would be wildly offended and they have all the political, most of the political power in the country. Right, right. So what can be done about all of this? Anything? Well, look, I think I think on the salt cap repeal, I mean, I think shame is is the best yes. effort to, to, to you know, to these these. Yeah, and by the way, there was a new, I, I forgot, forgot to mention this, there's a new study out just today from the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy, which shows that assault tax, uh, assault cap repeal would uh, seriously exacerbate the racial wealth gap in the country. Right. Uh, not, not surprisingly, uh, people of color 
would stand to gain almost nothing from a salt cap repeal and you know wealthy white people would stand to gain you know the most from this uh you know i, I mean it's not an inherently necessarily like a like a like a deliberately racial issue but if we're talking about sort of systemic racism or, or the way the economy is sort of systemically rigged against people of color and you want to fix that repealing the salt cap would be the opposite way uh, to fix that it would be the way to make that actually worse so my my hope is is that a public awareness campaign a kind of shame campaign of these democrats who are pushing this and, and i think a realistic goal is to like look there's a lot of political power behind repealing uh, this cap so, you know, would a win be that you don't you don't repeal it, you only raise it? I mean, that's still a bad policy, but like a full repeal is a total joke. Just yeah. one, one stat I'll give you on that. Six hundred billion dollars over eight years, just to give people perspective on how much that is. Joe Biden's proposal to raise the corporate tax rate on all corporations would raise about six hundred billion dollars over 15 years. So we're talking about. <laughs> a very large amount of money. If you want salt tax uh, cap you know, removed, repealed, please make your argument about why that is a good expenditure of $600 billion. Back of the envelope math, by the way, if 80% is going to the top 5%, that means the top 5% is getting about, what, what is it, $480 billion. And by the way, 56% not to get too bogged down in numbers, but 56% of the salt cap repeal goes to people making over $1 million a year. So the majority of the tax cut goes to people who are making not just have a million dollars in their, you know, people who are, who are making $1 million a year or more. It's unbelievable. Now you know why I'm mad about it.